Um, so why should we garden for wildlife? Well, I'm giving you a hint right here uh, with a photo of a, of a monarch butterfly, which some of you may know is um, having problems. The numbers of the monarch butterfly are dwindling a bit. And um, there's a lot that we can all help uh, do to help with that situation. So let's talk a little bit. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, why else should we garden for wildlife? Well, the North American bird populations have declined almost 30% in the last 50 years, which is kind of horrifying. There are a couple of billion less birds than there used to be. Um, this reduced number of birds, this kind of horrible thing, is actually linked to a reduction in the number of insects that we have. Some of you may have heard terms like insect Armageddon. Um, the thing is that insects perform so many important roles in our ecosystem, including the fact that they're food for birds. So if we don't have insects, we, we don't have pollinators for our own food. Uh, the insects themselves are food for birds, so it's going to affect our bird numbers. Uh, there have been studies that have shown that there's been a 76% decline in insects in areas in Germany in the last 25 years. And uh, there's been about a 40% decline worldwide of insects in the last 40 years. And this is all pretty horrifying. Um, the likely reason, some of the, the key reasons are habitat loss and pesticides. But the good news is, oh yeah, and of course, there's also the fact that the human population has doubled in this same time frame in about the last 50 years. Do you think that's a coincidence? I think not. Um, and so we may have contributed to this problem, but the good news is there's a lot that we can do to help reverse this trend. So one of the most important things that we need to know is that there are native plants that there are plants that are native to the area in which everyone lives. And the plants that are native to a given area are the plants that have the most value for wildlife and the ecosystem, and thus the most value for people too. The native plants are um, plants that have evolved in place in a certain area uh, over thousands of years. And they've evolved to have relationships with the animals in that same region. Um, interestingly, animals are nowhere near other animals. Animals other than people are nowhere near as adaptable as the human species is. Um, we'll use the monarchs in a minute as an example, but we'll also see that most other animals are just not as adaptable as we are, and they depend. They have a, a dependency for their very existence on the plants that they evolved with. And the, the plant that I'm showing you here in this photo is cut leaf toothwort. It's a native plant that's blooming as we speak um, in wood, woodland understories, probably near you. And I know just down the road from me, um, I'm featuring it because my husband and I are um, in the middle of a quest for some butterflies that depend on this plant and a few other native members of the mustard family as their only caterpillar food. Um, I should also mention that this picture is a, a fly. It's actually a bee fly and one of our early pollinators, early season pollinators. But the butterfly that my husband and I have been searching for is the falcate orange tip. Maybe you can get a sense of why it has that name. The tips of its wings are, are orange in the male. The female doesn't have that same marking. She's over here and she's a little more subdued in her coloration. But these little butterflies are only active for a few weeks in the spring when they're the food plants that their caterpillars depend on are up and blooming. And those caterpillar food plants, like the um, cut leaf toothwort that I just showed you, are spring ephemerals. They're only seen above ground for a few weeks in the early spring. Then they produce, they, they um, bloom. They hopefully entice some pollinators to help them to set fruit. They um, release their seeds and they die back. The above ground parts of the plant die back for the next 11 months. Um, and it's only during the period where this, uh, those plants are up above ground that you'll be able to see this butterfly. So without those plants, those native members of the mustard family, we wouldn't have this butterfly. So why use native plants? 
because they're essential to all the life in the ecosystem in which they evolved. The plants and animals depend on each other. The plants have evolved to try to entice animals, mostly insects, to help them with pollination because the plants are all about trying to reproduce. Um, and sometimes they use wind to help them with pollination, but most of the time, a uh, majority of the time, they have evolved to entice an animal to come visit their flowers and take their pollen to a flower of another plant, helping them to achieve cross-pollination. Um, the animals they also, the plants also depend on the animals to help disperse their seeds. So that's another interesting dependency as well. Uh, the animals depend on the plants for food. And the monarch butterflies are probably the most well-known of all animals for their dependency on a certain food. And it's not the butterflies themselves. This monarch butterfly is in fact drinking nectar from a, a milkweed. This is butterfly weed, or sometimes called butterfly milkweed but she can actually drink nectar from many different plants. She's not that picky about the sources of her nectar. It's her caterpillars, which you see down below here, that is only able to digest the leaves of members of the, the milkweeds. Um, and this butterfly has evolved to have that specialization because it protects her. Plants have evolved to try to protect themselves from being eaten. Um, they, yes, they want to entice pollinators to help them um, to, to cross pollinate. They want to entice animals to help them disperse their seeds. But um, on the other hand, they really don't want to be gnawed to the ground. And I don't know about you, but where I live, deer, for example, um, take more than what I would prefer to be their share of the plants in the area. So many plants have protections. They either protect themselves through chemicals or um, a deta something distasteful. Um, sometimes there are toxins and that is a strategy of the milkweeds. The milkweeds have uh, chemicals in them referred to as cardiac glycosides, which can be toxic if you were to eat enough of it. So that's a real discouraging uh, characteristic of these plants and is pretty effective in discouraging critters from eating the milkweeds, except there's always somebody who's evolved to be able to get around those protections. And the monarch butterflies are among the animals who have evolved to get around the protections of the milkweeds. In fact, they're able to sequester or, or sort of store those toxins in their body. Um, they don't harm the caterpillars. Uh, they protect the caterpillar actually from being eaten. They also protect the adult butterfly. The protection lasts that long. So that's why the monarchs have evolved to have this specialization. It's for their own protection, the protection that comes from the plants. Um, now, on the other hand, there's a risk to that. The only thing that the caterpillars can eat are the leaves and, and other of the milkweeds. So if milkweeds are not available, that's the end of the monarchs. Again, the butterflies, they'll drink nectar from lots of different plants. The caterpillars, not so much. They're very specific. And the thing is, this is a pretty well-known story. You may have already heard it maybe more than you want. But the, what's less well known is that most butterfly and moth caterpillars specialize to some extent, often on a few closely related plants for their very existence, for their caterpillar food. If the caterpillars are not fed, we don't get any adult um, butterflies or moths. And it turns out that e there are even other insects that specialize. There are bees that specialize. There are beetles that specialize. So if their special plants are not available, those critters all go away. And they're part of the food chain too. Um, birds, as I mentioned, rely on insects as a huge part of their diet. So let's move on. This butterfly, for example, this is a great spangled fritillary drinking nectar from a plant called wild bergamot, which is a member of the mint family. And it's a great garden plant. Um, it has a cluster of small flowers that have long tubes that welcome visitors to the flowers that uh, have a long tongue to get down there to get the nectar. So this butterfly drinks nectar from lots of different flowers. However, its caterpillars can only eat the leaves of violets like this downy yellow violet or this common blue violet or even this Canada violet. So without violets, we wouldn't have the great spangled fritillary butterfly. The adults 
and their kids, um, the, the caterpillars have completely different diets. Um, interestingly, this little flower here, this Canada violet is being visited by an ant. Now ants are not great pollinators, but they do like sweet treats. Um, but they actually perform a lot of other really important, so it, ants probably visiting the flower to get a little hit of nectar, probably won't help the, the plant too much with pollination. But it does help violets and many of our spring blooming plants, about 30% of the plants that bloom in the spring that are native to our area, depend on ants to help disperse their seeds. Uh, because the seeds have a little nutritious food packet on them called an eliasome that is the perfect chemical composition to entice ants to come eat the, uh, to come grab the seed, eat the eliasome, toss the seed on their little ant recycle heap, thus planting the seed, um, dispersing the seeds. Ants are actually pretty omnivorous. They like sweet treats. That's probably the reason we see the ant visiting this flower, but they also like to eat insects. And that eliasome, that little food packet on the seeds of many of our spring wildflowers has a chemical composition very similar to insects, which are another important source of food for ants, believe it or not. So ants help disperse our spring wildflowers, many of whom, many of the wildflowers are great in your garden. And ants also help to keep other insects in check in our garden. Uh, some of those ants may nest in the ground, others may nest in uh, rotting wood, and those ants end up being food for other animals, like this pileated woodpecker, who is probably excavated the former home of um, some carpenter ants, eaten the ants, and now has a place for, for their nest. Even chickadees, much smaller birds than the pileated woodpecker, excavate their own nests from soft wood that's probably been rot, rotted and maybe has already been prepared a little bit by other insects that are um, living in that wood. And even chickadees eat insects as an important part of their diet. This is a butterfly that you may have seen. This is a black swallowtail perched on the fruit capsules of white beard tongue. This particular plant is uh, finished blooming for the season, but it's getting ready to disperse its seeds. And the butterfly is perched there to catch a few rays of sun. Now this butterfly, again, drinks nectar from many different flowers, many different species of flowers, but their caterpillars can only eat the leaves of members of the carrot or parsley family. So if anybody out there ever grows something like parsley or dill or fennel or carrots, you may have seen this caterpillar uh, munching on the leaves because that's what the black swallowtail butterfly specializes on. So without that family of plants, we wouldn't have the black swallowtail butterfly. And I just like this caterpillar because I think it has a lot of personality. Um, this is a fairly common summer butterfly. This is a silver spotted skipper. Uh, and it specializes on members of the pea family as food for its caterpillars. So for example, the plant that we see over here on the left-hand side, um, this is blue false indigo. And it's one of the pea family members that the silver spotted skipper may lay her eggs on because her caterpillars are able to eat the leaves of this plant. She herself is drinking nectar from a plant called Ethiam, which is a type of dog bane, uh, which is a great plant for um, a meadow area, if you have such a thing. It's um, typically it begins to bloom in June and blooms through much of June and July. And it's a great source of early nectar when not a lot of other things may be blooming in June. Um, so she's drinking nectar from Indian hemp. She's going to lay her eggs on a pea family member, much like this, perhaps blue false indigo or another member. Um, and that's what her caterpillars will eat. And blue false indigo is a great garden plant. Now, some of those caterpillars are not going to make it to adulthood, which, you know, is always a little sad, but we have to feed the birds too. Some of those caterpillars are going to end up being food for birds, like this common yellow throat. This is a female who, uh, this may be a snack for herself, or she may be about to bring this back to her nest to feed her kids, her young birds that she's trying to raise. Birds really require 
insects as a high proportion of their diet, especially when they're raising their young. Caterpillars especially are usually, many of the species are kind of soft and uh, have a lot of nutrition. They're easy for a young bird to eat and digest. And so they're really a highly sought after and a needed source of food for birds. So think of it that way. So birds, if you like caterpillars in your garden, that's great. You may be um, feeding the next generation of butterflies or moths. And if you don't, well, you probably got some natural uh, um, caterpillar control in the form of birds nearby. Let's take a look at the pollinators. Um, who might be the pollinators for plants? People typically, it, uh, sort of a stimulus response kind of thing is if you say pollinator, many people think honeybee. And that's who we see in this photograph here, drinking nectar from the tiny flowers of the short-toothed mountain mint. But actually, honeybees are not the only pollinators and they're not even always the most efficient pollinators, surprisingly. There are many different um, partners in pollination, animals that partner with plants to help them with pollination. They don't do it out of altruism. They do it because they're being paid in the form of food. So plants have evolved to produce flowers um, to, uh, in order to help them reproduce. Plants are all about reproducing and surviving. So they have chemicals to deter critters from eating them down to the ground and destroying them. On the other hand, they have things to persuade animals to come visit their flowers and help them with cross-pollination. And even a plant, uh, a tiny little plant with tiny little flowers like bluets, as we see here, has so many different visitors to its flowers, any of whom may be helping with pollination. From bumblebees to beeflies, a type of fly, to butterflies, a mustard white, which is some um, dependent on mustard family members for its caterpillars, or even a moth. All of these were visitors to uh, one patch of bluets that I saw in a natural area. And bluets are actually great um, to be mixed in with your lawn. They're um, great on a path where there's moth, uh, moss rather. And um, they also have the leaves at the base of the plant that are tiny, but evergreen. So they're evergreen throughout the season, throughout the year. So there are many different types of insects that visit flowers and may be helping the, the flowers with pollination. Um, one of our early spring bloomers is Virginia bluebells. And this is in fact blooming now, at least in my neighborhood. This is a plant that starts out with pink buds it has um, long tubular flowers with nectar at the base of that flower. And it it's kind of designed for an insect who has a very long tongue that can reach to the tip of that flower to get the nectar. Um, and while it does that, its head's gonna be brushing against the reproductive parts of the flower. So this is a female bumblebee. I can tell she's a female. That's mostly what we see at this time of year anyway. The females are the first of the bees to emerge. She then begins to lay eggs and eventually there will be both sexes seen. But in the early spring, we see only females. And what she's doing is collecting nectar and pollen to bring back to feed her larva, her offspring in her nest. So she's feeding herself and she's also gathering food to, to feed her larva. And that food is comprised of a combination of pollen, uh, nectar and her own saliva. So we think of insects visiting flowers for nectar and they do, but actually pollen's a really important source of food. It has a lot of nutrients that insects need. Um, and it's only about 2% of pollen that actually makes it to another plant to actually help with pollination. The other 98% is used to pay off the pollinators. So an interesting trade-off. Um, there are many different uh, bees and there are many different species of bumblebees. There are about 21 species of bumblebees in the Eastern United States. Some have long tongues like the bumblebee we saw here. Some have short tongues and prefer flowers that are more open and uh, have nectar that's a little more accessible like the one that we see here. And again, we have a female who's collecting pollen and nectar 
to bring back to her nest to feed her larva. Uh, she was feeding on Canada anemone, which is a, a plant that spreads very readily. This is spring beauty, a wonderful spring blooming plant. It's been blooming for probably at least a month now and has at least a couple of weeks to go. This is a great plant as a, sort of a ground cover in your flower beds, um, rather than having mulch, it's really beneficial to have every inch covered with plants. Uh, they, they're your best defense against weeds um, and they help to keep the soil in place and they provide food for all kinds of pollinators and other critters. Uh, spring beauty is great as a ground cover in your beds. It's also great mixed in with your grass, with your lawn grass, if you don't try to kill everything um, other than grass in your lawn. So try not to use herbicides in your lawn. And spring beauty is a lovely little plant. It has um, a cluster of buds that bloom gradually over a period of many weeks. Um, this, this is a kind of a dramatic example of the kind of striping it might have. But the striping on the flowers can be anything from this deep pink that we see here, which is sort of my personal favorite, to a very pale uh, pink, almost white, that we'll see in a second. But those stripes are actually nectar guides, combining with these little yellow smudges here to attract pollinators. It's like the insect equivalent of a neon sign saying, food is available right here. Um, come visit me. Meanwhile, the insect will be brushing against the reproductive parts of the plant, helping the plant to be pollinated, the flower to be pollinated. Um, the uh, striping is actually, we can see this pretty easily. It's less easy to see in this particular spring beauty. It's just a less dramatically colored striping, but that striping is actually ultraviolet, which is um, a color, it, it's a, a type of coloration that bees are able to see, but human beings are not. Bees are um, they're red colorblind. They don't see red very well, but they do see all, and, but we can. So we've got something over them, but hey, they can see ultraviolet coloring and we cannot. So that's kind of cool. And here we see one of our spring um, bees. This is a, a mining bee that actually specializes on spring beauty. This little bee is able to consume the pollen from spring beauty. Without this, she and her larva wouldn't be able to survive. So she is collecting pollen and nectar to bring back to her nest. She's actually a solitary bee and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, she's carrying it also on her hind legs. She's called a mining bee because she's, um, she actually excavates her nest. And here we have, um, two separate insects, two separate uh, mining bees, each of whom has excavated their own nest. They're solitary bees. That means they don't share nests. It's, um, I live in Lambertville, New Jersey, and this is a town where the homes are pretty close together. So you could think of the, the bee world as being a little bit like Lambertville, that um, each of these bees has her own home. She's actually dug her own nest hole in the ground and she's laying eggs in it. She's got little cells for each egg and that um, pollen that we saw on the rear legs a minute ago, she's gonna put some of that in each cell for each of the eggs as, um, the, larva, as the eggs hatch and her larva develops, they'll have food. But they nest close together, but they each have their own nest. They're solitary. They're very gentle bees. They have absolutely no interest in stinging you. So, and they're, they're specific to spring beauty. If we didn't have spring beauty, we wouldn't have these bees. Um, on the other hand, it's very helpful for spring beauty. So the bees actually are pretty efficient then the way they handle the flowers. It's like, hey, I do the spring beauty flowers all the time. I know exactly how to go there, get what I want the most efficient possible way. It's sort of like an insect um, assembly line kind of equivalent. Um, and it's beneficial for the plant because the it's uh, highly likely that the bee will take whatever pollen is on her body to another spring beauty flower, not a flower of a different species. So it's likely to help with cross pollination. I always have to have little adult content. So those were the females who dig the nest, lay the eggs and provide the food for the, the uh, larva, the baby bees. 
Um, the males are the ones that contribute the sperm. So they cruise above the ground near the nest looking for a hookup. Um, another really interesting garden plant is shooting star. This is a native plant. Um, there are varieties with white flowers and others with pink flowers. This requires actually some special talent for pollination. It's not just any insect who's going to be a good pollinator for shooting star flowers, because it requires an insect who's able to cling to the bottom of the flower, um, vibrate their wing muscles without actually moving their wings, and actually set up enough of a vibration to have the pollen come out of the flower. Um, sort of like shaking confectioner sugar or a salt shaker onto the body of the bee. And here we can see it a little bit better that the bee is again clinging to the bottom of the flower. She's vibrating her wing muscles and the pollen is coming out, dusting the underside of her abdomen. And this sort of long white thing, that's the female reproductive part. As the bee comes to a new flower, if she has pollen on her abdomen, the first thing that she's going to touch is the part of the flower where pollen needs to be placed in order for pollination to take place. Is that cool or what? Then she does her little uh, buzz pollination thing. More pollen comes out, dusts her abdomen, and she takes that off to the next flower. Now, it's not every bee that has this capability, that has this athletic ability. Um, bees, for example, do not they can't do buzz pollination. So they're not great candidates to pollinate this plant. Interestingly, they're also, honeybees are also not the best pollinators of some of our food crops. Um, this is a flower cluster from highbush blueberry, which is actually a great landscape plant. Highbush blueberry has a fabulous fall color, beautiful luscious reds that I think far surpass that of burning bush which is a non-native plant that becomes invasive that many people use in landscaping. So rip out your burning bush if you have it, replace it with high bush blueberry or low bush blueberry if you prefer a shorter plant. Well, back to the pollination stories. This plant, the blueberries, are also most efficiently pollinated by an insect who has the ability to do buzz pollination hang from below the plant, the flower, cling to it, and do that little uh, muscle vibration thing with their shoulder muscles. That dusts out the pollen. Again, honeybees can't do that. Um, and it's not just blueberries that have this special requirement or that are most effectively pollinated this way. Tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, um, cranberries, all of those, have the same kind of um, behavior and they are most efficiently pollinated by insects are native bees who have this capability. Uh, we're not the only animals that like to eat blueberries. Animals as diverse as chipmunks, bears, and even box turtles like to eat the fruit, as well as many birds, including those that we see here, bluebirds, robins, cardinals, catbirds, and many others love to eat the berries of bluebirds. Some of these birds are actually gonna be dispersing the seeds of um, blueberries once the, um, the fruit goes, the seeds go through the bird's digestive tract. They disperse the seeds at a different location. Another, I saw my first uh, blooming wild geranium today, and it's just a lovely plant, a beautiful garden plant. Um, that is great for lots of different pollinators. It has an open flower, which is welcoming to butterflies like the spring azure that we see over in the left lower corner or, or many different bees. Jacob's ladder is a great spring blooming plant that has foliage that lasts throughout most of the season. Sometimes if the winter's not too bad, you might even see the foliage through the winter. And it has these lovely blue bell-shaped flowers that are open enough to be welcoming to lots of different kinds of pollinators. It even um, may be attractive to hummingbirds in some cases. And speaking of hummingbirds, Wild columbine is a native plant that is a beautiful garden plant. It, even, it, it can really tolerate tough conditions. It will even uh, do well in a rock garden type situation because that's the kind of habitat that it grew up in, that it evolved in. And this flower has 
evolved to um, partner with ruby-throated hummingbirds as its perfect pollinator. The nectar is found at the tips of these flower spurs. And what's the, the best pollinator for this is someone who has a tongue long enough to go the length of those spurs and who will then touch the reproductive parts of the flower as they drink. And that, that perfect partner is the ruby-throated hummingbird, who, by the way, should be arriving any moment. There's actually a website that you can um, check to see about uh, how far north the hummingbirds have come. The hummingbirds spend the winter in um, Central America, Mexico, maybe Florida at the furthest north. And then about this time of year, they return. The males return first, and that's who we see here. They're the only ones that have the ruby throat. They have to show up off in order to attract a female. The females show up about a week later, and it's actually, so the two mate, the males and the females mate, and then they pretty much part ways. The female spends the rest of the season as a single mom, and she's the one that actually builds the nest. Um, you know, she lays the, she sits on the eggs until they hatch, and then she feeds the kids all by herself. What she needs in order to make a nest are materials like lichens. Um, she'll use that as the outside of, uh, on the outside of her nest. She may also use the um, spore cases from, soft spore cases from cinnamon fern or some other soft material as lining on the inside of the nest. She ties it all together with spider silk because it has, spider silk is super strong and yet it has a little bit of stretch, sort of like that 5% spandex in your pants that makes it more comfortable after you've eaten a heavy dinner. It's like that. And she uses this all to build her nest. Um, we'll talk more about the kind of flowers that uh, might be beneficial to her. Um, this is common milkweed. Um, this is a plant that's not beneficial just to monarchs, but actually to many different pollinators. Here we see a bumblebee visiting. Uh, this is a different type of milkweed called butterfly weed. And you can see here that there's no false advertising in this name. Another common name for this plant is butterfly milkweed. We've got three different species of butterflies all feeding on this one plant. We've got a monarch, it's bangled fritillary and a pearl crescent, all taking advantage of the nectar provided by the flowers. This is another species that's pretty versatile. Its name is swamp milkweed, it's sometimes called rose milkweed. Don't be deceived by the name. It can tolerate a broad range of uh, soil moistures. It, it can tolerate wet soil, um, but it can also uh, tolerate pretty average moisture in soil. And all three of these are good in gardens, although common milkweed probably spreads more readily than the others. So it's better in a larger garden setting or um, a meadow maybe. Um, but all are great sources of nectar. Here we can see a snowberry clearwing moth drinking nectar, a little critter that looks like a cross between a bumblebee and uh, a hummingbird. And you might see something else on this plant that looks familiar to some of you. Uh, there are aphids on the stem. And you might be thinking, ooh, aphids, get rid of those. Well, you can if you want to, but it actually typically doesn't do all that much harm to the plant. In fact, there are some studies that show that if there are aphids present on milkweeds, it actually triggers the milkweed to produce chemicals that are more favorable to the development of monarch butterfly caterpillars. But another interesting thing about aphids is that ants will um, protect them actually. They, um, ants, aphids tap into a plant, get the plant's uh, saps and that goes through the aphids digestive system and aphids produce something called honeydew, which is their excrement, but it's sweet and ants like to eat it. So the ants will actually protect the aphids. If ants are on the plant, that could be a downside for a monarch caterpillar because ants actually like to eat caterpillars. So interesting relationships there. Um, but a, another way to control aphids is that lady beetle larvae like to eat aphids. So this poor little aphid is actually being eaten by two different critters at the same time. If you see this little bump over here, that's a 
a typical sign of a braconid wasp, a parasitic wasp that um, develops inside the aphid, eating it from the inside out, leaving nothing but an empty husk. But at the same time, it's being bitten in the bus butt by a uh, lady bee larva. So that little aphid has, just doesn't have a prayer. Milkweeds um, also have other good qualities. The uh, fluff that's attached to their seeds, which the plant means to help disperse the seeds because it travels well through the air by wind, is very light and buoyant and was actually used during World War II to stuff life vests. And it's now being used uh, commercially, at least in a limited way, to stuff winter clothing like gloves and vests and things like that. But that fluff is also something that could be used by a bird to line their nests. And that and the fibers inside the stems of uh, milkweeds and Indian hemp or other dog veins can be used to make bird's nests. So Baltimore Orioles, for example, or um, yellow warblers, both use those fibers to help build their nests. Uh, if we go back to the hummingbirds for a minute, cardinal flower is more of a summer bloomer. This is a great plant. This was designed for hummingbirds. It evolved to have hummingbirds be their perfect pollinator. And you can see that the flower fits on the bird like a hand in glove. So this little blob of yellow is actually the pollen that's being deposited on the hummingbird's head as she drinks nectar from this flower. She'll go to the next uh, cardinal flower plant and hopefully deposit that on a female flower, flower in the female phase. Bee balm is another great uh, plant for both hummingbirds and hummingbird moths as well as other uh, critters, often butterflies. Wild bergamot is very appealing to hummingbirds, hummingbird moths, and you'll often see butterflies and bees there. And these, mem these are members of the mint family, both bee balm and wild bergamot. So they do have some deer resistance. Bee balm can actually um, tolerate a little bit more shade than wild bergamot does. And I, I have, however, seen deer eat the flowers of uh, wild bergamot, I'm sorry bee balm, but they tend to leave the plants alone. Another mint family member that's great for all different kinds of pollinators. I've even seen hummingbirds visit this, but butterflies and bees are more common visitors like this uh, Eastern tiger swallowtail or this bumblebee, uh, is purple giant hyssop. This is a mint family member and it's really very deer resistant. So it's a, it's a good quality as a garden plant. And if you leave the stem standing in the winter, you may find birds foraging there for seeds to eat. So that's another good thing to do. Uh, this is a plant that typically begins to bloom in June and blooms for much of June and July. This is Virginia spiderwort. It has these luscious, beautiful blue flowers. Um, it has a big cluster of them. You can see lots of buds in the background here. Each flower actually opens and blooms in this, the morning and by afternoon it's finishing up. So morning is the most beautiful time for these flowers. And they're visited by lots of different pollinators, including bees. And again, we can see that this is a female collecting food to take back to her nest and flies. You might, it might surprise you to know that this is a fly disguised as something more ferocious like a bee or maybe a wasp to try to prevent um, other animals, predators from eating her. Um, and it looks to me like she's about to harvest some of the pollen. Flies also are um, interested in not just drinking nectar, but also eating pollen. And they're very good pollinators, especially in shoulder seasons like the spring and the fall. Um, flies are able to fly at pretty low temperatures. So they're really important pollinators in spring and fall, as well as throughout the, the warmer months. Other fabulous mint family members are the mountain mints. This is my personal favorite, short toothed mountain mint, which has um, sort of a, an appearance on the upper leaves as if it were coated with confectioner's sugar. And there are clusters of teeny little flowers that bloom over a period of many weeks. These plants typically bloom at least eight to 12 weeks, starting late June and well through August, maybe even into early September. Many different pollinators visit, bees, butterflies, um, and all kinds of other critters as well. 
A very similar looking, slightly taller plant is Hoary Mountain Mint. Again, you have a cluster of small flowers that bloom over a long period of time. So it provides beauty for you and food for pollinators over many, many weeks during the summer. And a third species I'm gonna highlight of mountain mint is Virginia mountain mint. This has uh, long narrow leaves, but again, the wonderful clusters of uh, tiny flowers smudged with purple to attract lots of different pollinators to visit. Um, an aster family member, Joe pie weed is a butterfly magnet. And here we see at least four butterflies on this one cluster with another three butterflies down below. It's a fabulous plant for lots of different pollinators. It can get to be quite tall. So if you uh, want a tall plant in your garden, this is the ticket. Iron, very attractive flowers. I love them. I'm attracted to them. These bright purple flowers. Um, They're great for butterflies and bees um, of all kinds and description. The cone flowers. This is a cone flower that is um, a black eyed Susan lookalike. This is called showy cone flower, and it actually has an advantage over um, black eyed Susan. Black eyed Susan is actually a biennial, which means that it only lives for two years and then hopefully it'll reseed itself. Showy cone flower has the same kind of look, but it actually has a longer lifespan. So um, you don't have to worry about it receding itself quite as much. And it's being visited here by a leaf cutter bee who carries her pollen back to her nest on the underside of her abdomen. This is probably my favorite of the cone flowers. This is green headed cone flower um, named for the little blob in the center where there are many disc flowers. Each of these little pointy things is a flower. They open over a period of many days or weeks, um, providing food for pollinators. You can see that it's accommodating both a bumblebee and a butterfly at the same time. And that's because there are individual flowers here. The ray flowers are there, the, the petal-like things, to attract pollinators. The real business of pollination goes on in these little disc flowers that we see in the center. And if those flowers are pollinated, I always see goldfinches rooting around later in the season looking for seeds. Another great garden plant is Helen's flower. Again, this is an aster family member like the other cone flowers are. And in the center are many disc flowers that open gradually over a period of many weeks. And then they have these lovely, delicate, but um, I don't know, graceful looking lobed petals or um, ray flowers. All of the asters are fabulous for pollinators and for, um, they actually also support many caterpillars as well. Uh, this is a monarch butterfly on New England aster, which will typically begin blooming anytime uh, about mid-July and you'll see it blooming into October. This is a favorite of mine. It's a bit later summer bloomer. It has kind of a bushy habitat. It's called aromatic aster. It's sort of like a, a a uh, smaller but bushier New England aster. And um, it's called aromatic aster because the foliage does have a little bit of a fragrance um, that's probably more easily detected by animals other than people, at least me. And it's being visited here by a surfeit fly who's disguised, disguised as a bee or a wasp. A favorite in my own garden, I have shade and a uh, favorite in my garden is blue wood aster, which we see here which is, um, it begins to bloom by late September and blooms into early November. So what can you say that, you know, blooms at that time of year, especially in a shade garden, it's fabulous. Um, and it attracts all kinds of critters, lots of bees who know to go to the yellow flowers, not the pink flowers. The pink flowers are finished. Um, so the plants intelligent enough to have a signal to direct the pollinators to the, the flowers that are open for business. It also attracts butterflies, even at that time of the year. This was taken, I think, at the very end of October. Goldenrods are fabulous garden plants and fabulous for pollinators. They support so many different species of insects as pollinators and also um, 
as food for the caterpillars or other larvae that are developing there. Um, some that I'll have, there are many different species of goldenrod. Not all are suitable for small gardens like Canada goldenrod, I wouldn't suggest for that. But two that I have in my own shade garden are wreath goldenrod, also called blue stemmed goldenrod and zigzag goldenrod. Both are fall bloomers, they're great. Zigzag is a little bit later than wreath goldenrod. Uh, two for sunnier gardens would be um, showy goldenrod and grass leaved goldenrod. Both great for pollinators. We'll just talk about a few shrubs. Um, this is spice bush, which actually is probably finished blooming, at least in my neighborhood. You guys are a little bit further north, so you might still see it in bloom. It has beautiful flowers that bloom at about the same time as forsythia, but to me, it has so much more entertainment value and value for wildlife. So the flowers attract lots of different pollinators. Here we have a spring azure butterfly visiting for nectar. But it also is food for the caterpillars of the spice bush swallowtail butterfly, which we see in the upper uh, right corner. So here we have a caterpillar feeding on the leaves of spice bush. Another wonderful critter is uh, the promethea moth, also uses spice bush as caterpillar food. So you can look for that. Uh, and these moths actually emerge. This is the winter cocoon. The Promethea moth survives the winter in this cocoon made from a leaf that she wrapped around herself, um, spun silk to keep it together. And she was she uh, developed inside that cocoon. And they typically emerge about the third week of May, about two o'clock in the afternoon. Now, some of those caterpillars, again, are not gonna make it to adulthood. They'll be bird food, like for this Carolina wren. If the flowers are pollinated, wonderful red fruits develop and are ripened by September, and they're quickly eaten by either our local resident birds or migrating warblers like this parallel warbler that stopped in my yard a couple of years ago. Great dogwood is a fabulous plant that's used by azure butterflies as caterpillar food. This butterfly is about to lay an egg, but the caterpillars aren't gonna eat everything. There's still plenty of flowers left for pollinators. And if the flowers are pollinated, fruit is produced that typically um, ripens in August and is eaten almost right away by the birds. Nine bark, uh, again, it can be used by the azure butterflies for caterpillar food, but the flowers when they bloom are there available for many different pollinators to visit like this red admiral butterfly. Some of the caterpillars may have become well, this male is teaching his uh, young offspring about how to get food. This is just beginning to bloom around me, flowering dogwood and if we were alive, if, if I could interact directly with you, I'd ask you how many flowers you see. Many people think this is a single flower. These big white things that look like petals are not petals at all, they're bracts. They were the bud scales protecting these small yellowish green flowers in the center of which there are several. There's probably in the neighborhood of 20 of them. Um, the bracts open up and get bigger and bigger and bigger and they turn white. They act as attractants to bring the pollinators to these little flowers in the center. And if they're pollinated, we get red fruit in the fall, which again is eaten by many birds, including the cardinals that we share our space with. Um, just a couple of vines. If you're looking for something to cover a fence or an arbor, this is a fabulous plant. It has big heart-shaped leaves and flowers that look like a little pipe, thus the name, Dutchman's Pipe Vine. This attracts kind of specialized pollinators. Um, they're actually um, fungus gnats are among the pollinators. They're attracted by the fact that this sort of looks like the underside of a mushroom, which is where they would typically be laying their eggs. There's a whole story about the, they're actually held prisoner in there until the um, male reproductive parts are mature, but that's a story for another day. What another interesting thing about the Dutchman's pipe vine is the fact that it's caterpillar food for this beautiful butterfly, the pipe vine swallowtail, and she is in the process of laying her eggs. She's about to pop one out here. I can you can see another couple that she's already laid. Uh, trumpet honeysuckle is another great plant for um, hummingbirds, ruby-throated hummingbirds. That long red tube 
is just uh, the perfect match for the, the anatomy of the uh, ruby-throated hummingbirds. And if the hummingbirds do their job and the flowers are pollinated, fruit will be produced that will be eaten by birds later. And uh, just a little bit about lawns. I'm going to share something, my own personal experience with you. This is what my lawn used to look like maybe 10 years ago. And my front door is over here on the right. Um, we had a grove of trees, we still do, and it's bigger than ever now over here on the left. And in between is um, something that was, we, we kept trying to grow grass and found it to be impossible. And that's because grass, lawn grass does not like to grow in the shade, it just won't. So if you're trying to do what I tried to do for years, don't take advantage of my experience, don't even bother. The green stuff that is here, this is moss. Moss was very happy there. Um, the grass, it died every year by July. So, and in, if it rained, we got this. Looked pretty terrible. It was just a mud pit, kind of awful. So we finally got smart, got permission to plant shade loving native plants. I actually had a little access there. And now we don't have that problem at all. So less lawn is more, is better. And we, the, the moss that we had is uh, a nice little path through the garden. So we've, we've got, um, and this is blooming right now. This is like, a, this was a few years ago. So my garden is even more filled in now, but the foam flower is blooming. This is golden ragwort that's blooming. I let Virginia creeper be part of the mix, which is what we see here with leaves. Um, many different flowers that are great. And that's just the spring. Um, check my blog for what I planted for the rest of the year. Uh, other things that you wanna consider for a wildlife friendly garden are don't use pesticides um, ever, not, especially not in your beds, don't use them. You're gonna be killing little critters like this Eastern tail blue butterfly. And if you don't use pesticides, you might be able to actually use the dandelion leaves in your your dinner uh, salads. Don't use herbicides either. The chemical companies, when I was a kid, we had um, clover in our backyard and we had violets in our backyard mixed in with the lawn. And that was normal. Nobody ever thought anything of it. Nobody thought that was a terrible thing. In fact, I would go out as a kid and pick a little bouquets of violets and white clover to bring into the house to give to my mom. So that was kind of a fun thing. But then the chemical companies decided that, oh, and I should have also mentioned that grass seed mixes at that time, and I won't say exactly when that was, um, actually included clover because clover adds nitrogen to the soil and nitrogen helps grass to grow. It's a, a nutrient that grass needs. But then the chemical companies decided that if they sold us chemicals that would kill the clover, that would be something they could sell. So that's cool and, or profitable anyway. And then um, they could sell us something that adds nitrogen to the soil. So win-win for the chemical companies, but not so much of a win for us. Many of those chemicals are actually quite toxic. So they're not good for you. They're not good for your pets. They're not good for your kids, your grandkids. Don't use them. Use natural pest controls instead. The more native plants that you have in your yard or garden, the more diversity of animals that you're gonna attract. Lots of different insects, many of which you'll never see unless you're just out there looking. And they'll help to keep others in control. This is a wheel bug, a type of assassin bug who's eating a Japanese beetle, for example. And I like to think that the others over here in the corner are cowering in fear, but I'm not sure that's true. Um, this is a wasp, it's a scolded wasp lays her eggs in the nests of beetles like Japanese beetles. So her larva eats Japanese beetle larva. So she'll help to keep that in control. And by the way, Japanese beetles like to nest in lawn areas. So reduce your lawn and you'll have less problem with Japanese beetles. Uh, this is a tachinid fly. And again, visiting flowers, she's a good pollinator, but her larva eat insects and in fact stink bugs are among the insects that are fed to her that she'll feed to her larva. Birds are another great source of um, insect control. Insects are a huge portion of their diet and if you don't believe that I think this picture tells it all because 
This little song sparrow is surrounded by ripening fruit and a wild cherry tree, but what does she have in her mouth? But a caterpillar. So they need both and they especially need insects. So make sure you have shelter in your garden for uh, birds and other critters. Um, trees are great. Uh, having some evergreens are good. This is an arborvitae sheltering a yellow rumped warbler in the fall. They need places to raise their young. Some birds nest at the ground level, some in the shrubs, some in higher up in the trees like this wood thrush. Leave the leaves in your flower beds. Do not remove the fallen leaves from your flower beds in the fall. It is shelter for many insects and that the insects need that in order to survive themselves or those insects may become food for foraging birds in the winter too. So leave your leaves in the fall. Um, and in the spring, what should you do with the leaves in your flower beds? Leave them because the plants are able to get, find their way through the leaves, no problem. Um, and they, the leaves act as the perfect mulch and it's free. Um, if you can also leave spent stems of your perennials standing in your gardens in the winter because they provide shelter for many different insects. Um, and those insects may be food for birds or other animals or the seeds on the uh, plants may be food for birds. And there also may be nest next year's nesting material here. Just as an example of uh, insects that are sheltering in winter stems, this is a goldenrod gall, and there's a, a particular type of fly who develops in there. As the, uh, the, leg, the egg is laid by the fly on the stem of the goldenrod, the um, insect develops inside the stem, and that triggers the plant to develop this uh, unnatural tissue that the insect actually consumes. And it, so it's a shelter and food for the insect during the winter, unless someone else like this downy woodpecker has learned that that's a source of food for the woodpecker during the winter. Again, the seed heads that are left may be sources of food for birds. Make sure you provide water. And so to attract a variety of birds, butterflies, bees, and lots of other critters, flies are great pollinators. Make sure you have a variety of native plants. Don't be too neat. I don't know about you, but where I live, we have a lot of ash trees that we're losing to the Emerald Ash Borer. And I, I live in a townhouse development. I've convinced my homeowners association to leave snags about 20 feet tall where it's safe to do that so that it could be potentially a nesting place like for this great horned owl. This wasn't taken at my development, however. So just summarize some tips. Um, for insects, welcome both the adults, like the butterflies and their kids, the caterpillars, to your garden. Um, you want at least 75 to 80 percent of the plants in your garden to be native, because that's what it takes to feed a clutch of hungry uh, chickadee babies. So there are, actually have been studies that show that. Don't use pesticides or herbicides. They're bad for you, your pets, and your kids. Um, they could be bad for your water supply, too. Leave the fallen leaves in your flower beds. Leave your spent perennials standing. Even consider a brush pile. If you didn't wanna leave your spent perennials standing, you could cut them and put them in a brush pile over in a corner. That's good habitat for insects, for birds, and it's also food. And remove non-native invasive plants, like believe it or not, butterfly bush is one of those. Japanese barberry and burning bush are, are a couple more that are frequently used still in landscaping. And so I, I recommend that you remove them if you have them and replace them with something native. So a little bit over, but um, sometimes I get questions. All the photos were mine, except a few that were my husband's uh, and one that I did borrow from someone online. And I do have a website if you're interested in learning more. If I have a shade garden, by the way. And if you're interested in more details about what I put in my shade garden, you can go to my blog and just type in the word shade in the search field. And it'll bring up, there was like a three-part series on what I put in. And of course, I've tinkered with it since then, but um, just for your information. So I'll, I'll go back one slide. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Or well, thank you so okay. much. Oh, darn. Was that me? Um, hello? 
Uh, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I just heard myself coming back as as uh, as a bad as a bad uh, echo. Uh, thank you so much, Marianne. This was just fascinating, and and I'm just blown away by how much you know about this stuff. Um, one of the things that I, I think might have happened because we had a ton of people signed up for tonight. Um, and I don't know if something catastrophic happened in terms of sending the Zoom out, but I will make sure that, that the recording is out for a week if that's okay for you. I'm sure that's fine. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, You're welcome. I will make sure that that, that is, is taken care of. Um, now, I do have a question. Um, is any meal, milkweed okay? Well, it's actually recommended that you use milkweeds that are native to our area. And the three that I highlighted are all native. There are some others as well that are less common and less commonly found in, in um, you know, nurseries. But okay. um, it's actually not so much recommended to use tropical milkweed um, because it sort of helps to promote disease. Um, okay. uh, but so it's most effective to use the milkweeds that are native to our area. And the three that I suggested were swamp milkweed, um, butterfly weed, and common milkweed. Common milkweed, you kind of need a bigger space. The other two are pretty well behaved in garden. So I was actually under the impression that dog bane was another milkweed, but it's not. They're actually closely related. Depending on the um, the botanist, the, the source that you refer to, um, currently probably the most commonly accepted is that milkweed is in the dog bane family. Um, wow. There have been some wow. times where they were separate families. Some botanists consider milkweed to be a subfamily of the dog bane family. But um, currently, their milkweed is considered to be in the dog bane family. And they do share some characteristics, like um, they have the fibers in the stems, um, they have the toxins in them, but they're not so closely matched in, in terms of their chemical composition that uh, monarchs can use them. Monarchs do not use them. Interesting. Okay. There's, there's some beetles. Yeah, there, there's some beetles that use milkweeds that also use dog bane but um, not monarchs. So uh, on another question for you, um, you know, I, I have actually been yanking out all of my violets because I feel that they're quite invasive. <laughs> you made me feel fabulously guilty. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> well, they, they can um, kind of take over. Interestingly, common blue violet uh, spreads the most readily. Yeah. But some of the others are a little more, um, a little slower to spread. Um, there's one that has blue flowers called Labrador violet that spreads a little more slowly. There's one that has sort of a cream colored flower called pale violet, viola striata. Um, it's called stripe violet, pale violet. It's got many aliases. That one spreads more slowly. Um, but, you know, and everybody has to make their own choices about what you want to see in your garden. Um, I, I, my question is, will, will any violet do? Um, you know, I think most violets are native and, um, yeah, as far as I know, the, um, fritillary butterflies are pretty eclectic in their tastes for violets. Okay. Common blue is in fact, one of the ones that they use. So. All righty. Well, I'm, I'm going to feel, I'm, I'm going to be a lot more judicious about, um, 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 yeah. Yanking them. <laughs> yeah, everybody makes their own choices. I actually bought some mints. I have I bought um, an arrow arrowwood viburnum a few years ago that came with a bonus violet that has since spread throughout my garden. So it's sort of a ground cover, the violets are. And I decided to um, have uh, to get a mint that spreads pretty readily to have it duke it out with the violets and see see who wins or mix them up anyway. I just got the mint last year though, so we'll see how it does. So, so speaking, speaking of mints, I, I'm sorry I'm taking up, if anybody wants to, to jump in here, but this is like so fascinating to me. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, I bought a couple of plugs of Pycnanthema muticum, the Virginia mountain mint, uh, or the short tooth. Or short, short tooth mountain mint, right. So it's yeah, a cluster. And, and 
really, if anybody is listening to this and if they want, it spreads, it, it's a big girl. Um, <laughs> uh, but man, I mean, watching that in the fall and the late summer, it's like, it's like insect city. You know, there's every single you know, plant, uh, every single little insect is there and it's so fascinating. And if, if anybody wants it, I'm happy to share. They are pollinator magnets. I have mostly shade. I have some afternoon sun and I put some mountain mint in the place where I have afternoon sun and, and it, it kind of stays there pretty well. In a sunny spot, it will spread more readily, but um, so plant something next to it that also uh, can hold its own. But they're fabulous pollinator magnets. They're really terrific. And they're just really pretty. I planted I planted uh, New England aster next to, to mine and they are, you know, they're competing, but they are they're doing okay. Good. Good. All right. So does anybody have a, have any questions that they want to ask? I'm sorry, I hogged the conversation. No. Um so you know what, uh, Marianne, thank you so much for tonight. This was this was absolutely lovely, and um, and and thank you for being willing to to. I think there may have been somebody who who didn't get the. I, I think something cut, catastrophic happened with the the sign up. So thank you so much for being willing to share with us. Oh, you're welcome. Um, it's my pleasure. And um. And onwards and upwards to pollinators and let's let's make that happen. And thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a good one. Take thank care. you, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.